You may have seen a post recently on social media. A few creators and veterinarians are posting about a new lawsuit that is being filed against Hills Pet Nutrition. And this is both exciting for a lot of us in the holistic pet space, especially those of us who are proponents for feeding fresh foods to our uh, dogs and cats. It is potentially also a really wonderful turn of events in the pet food space in general, because as you have heard in previous episodes, whether it's on the Pet Parenting Reset or on my other podcast, Pet Health Junkies, um, there was a recent episode that specifically I want to talk about where Pam Janet and I talked to Billy Hookman of Green Juju, and he kind of threw in a little bit of like insider information into what he sees in AFCO meetings. If you're not familiar with AFCO, it's the American Association of Feed Control Officials. And they provide guidelines for pet feed and pet food, as well as livestock feed that then the states take on as regulation. They opt to take on, the majority of the states do opt to take on their guidance as regulation. And it is a particularly, um, I want to use the word insidious, <laughs> uh, organization that is set up to where a lot of the waste in human food manufacturing is utilized in pet feed and pet food. That's not always the case. We do have a lot of smaller companies that do really wonderful work with incredible ingredients, even human grade ingredients, and sourcing is really important to them. So th this isn't a one size fits all narrative that I'm giving you. But my hope is that this is just one more thing to help turn the tide to where more and more people start thinking more critically about what they're putting in their pet's bodies. So what is this lawsuit that uh, has been filed against Hills Pet Nutrition? <coughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. So what is this lawsuit that uh, has been filed against Hills Pet Nutrition? I took a couple of days after I first heard about it. Um, I, first heard, I first saw Dr. Lori Kozier post about it on the Healthy Dog Workshop social media um, right after Kimberly Gautier with Keep the Tail Wagging posted about it. And there's a lot of hope that it is happening specifically in the healthy pet space. So I kind of waited for um, Susan Thixton to post about what was going on. She is the number one consumer advocate in the pet food space. And so I hold a lot of credence to what she says and her uh, beliefs and how she, how she understands what's happening in the pet food industry. She knows better than anyone else that I know uh, about what's happening in the pet food industry and how some of these things may play out. So let's go back a few years to the DCM debacle. <laughs> it was a huge problem and was it blown out of proportion? I don't know. Dogs were certainly 
having issues. Um, there were more dogs than ever being diagnosed with dilated cardiomyopathy, um, which is a condition of the heart. And it seemed to be because there are uh, breeds of dogs that are genetically predisposed to DCM, but this seemed to be food related. And so there was this big hubbub that targeted grain free pet foods, grain free kibble. And there's still a lot of debate around it. The FDA eventually closed their investigation and said, we don't know what happened. Very quietly closed the investigation, updated a page on their website to basically say it ran its course, we never figured out anything, and the case is closed. They didn't make a huge thing about closing it. It was literally just an update on their website. So I did a whole podcast episode about a second theory that has been um, made aware by Dr. Karen Becker, Steve Brown, who's an incredible formulator. Um, and, they, and those two, along with Susan Thixton, are working to uh, study the effect of these bagged kibble foods or even canned foods from um, these big pet food manufacturers and feeding less than the recommended amount daily to your pet. Um, so we'll talk about that for just a minute. So I can kind of give you, I can kind of bring you up to date and then we'll talk about this lawsuit and Susan's thoughts on it and what we kind of think may happen going forward. So. The original theory with these grain-free diets, so it was very quickly said as soon as like the FDA started their investigation into increased cases of DCM in dogs, they very quickly started blaming the more novel and exotic smaller brands of pet food that were starting to gain in market share. And saying that because they're not using grains in the food, uh, we think this is the problem. And so more and more people started latching on. Well, is this, is this true? How could this be true? And one of the things that is true um, is that when you remove grains from a kibble, a dry food, uh, kibble that is high heat process to get those little bits and pieces to stick together you have to add some sort of starchy carbohydrate in place of the grains so they were using legumes and with the high volume of legumes being used in these foods um, it was theorized that they were creating anti-nutrient properties in the foods because Legumes can do that. Um, and again, the, the previous episode that I did goes way into more detail. I will link that in the show notes just so you have easy access to it and don't have to go searching for it. And basically what these anti-nutrient properties of legumes do, if fed in quantities great enough to actually cause a problem, that's an if, if, it, if, that, if that was happening, it was basically blocking the absorption of the nutrients from the rest of the food. So uh, thereby causing these nutrient deficiencies that were then causing additional uh, DCM cases, you know, the, the cases of DCM in dogs were on the rise. After the FDA closed their investigation and said, we don't actually know what happened, um, Nobody really updated the guidance or the guidelines. So still, and to this day, if you walk into a veterinarian's office, a traditional medicine veterinarian in the United States, they are likely going to tell you to steer clear of grain-free kibble. That was what everyone was told, and no guidance was updated. So 
After all of that happened, the FDA closed their case. Dr. Karen Becker, Steve Brown, Susan, Susan Thixton started looking into when people feed less than the recommended daily amounts on their pet food bag, what happens? Because, and we've talked about this so many times on this podcast, and I'm going to continue to talk about it because I just have such a passion in using food as medicine in, in food, have, getting our nutrients, getting nutrition from food. But when we have these foods, whether it's a can or a bag, and it goes through high heat processing and multiple um, rounds of high heat processing, which kibble does, and a lot of uh, canned foods do as well. There's little to no nutrition left in those foods that the, that company started out with. So they add back in synthetic nutrients. We often call them premixes, vitamin and mineral packs, something of that sort. And so if you have a recommended daily allowance or da a re recommended daily feeding on that package based on AFCO minimum requirements of you know, the, the, all the different nutrient levels, and it's synthetic, mind you. Or at least the bulk of it is synthetic. I'll, I'll try to try to be a little less biased. Um, let's just say the bulk of the nutrition is synthetic. I'd like to say all of it is, but let's say the bulk of it is. And you're feeding less, which happens often, right? You go into your veterinarian's office, your dog is eating kibble, so it's getting a ton of carbohydrates, and they're gaining weight. So your vet says feed less food. Happens all the time all the time is your dog or cat then getting all of the nutrients they need every day what about throughout a week the course of a week hmm it doesn't seem likely and these are the tests these are these are studies that are being done right now um so that is something else for us to think about. But that catches us up to today and the lawsuit that was just filed on February 6, 2024 against Hills Pet Food. So what I'd like to do is just do a quick run through of Susan's blog, Susan Thixton on Truth About Pet Food. It is titled Lawsuit Claims Hills Pet Food and Veterinarians Fabricated Grain-Free Diet Scare. And they have a slew of evidence to back up their claims. And that was one of the first things that I thought of when I saw that this lawsuit had been filed. Because the reality is, in the world we live in, who's right and who's wrong often doesn't matter in the legal system. Um, when a lawyer takes on a case and decides to file suit, it isn't always because they know their client is right. That's like the foundation of talking to the client in the first place is or taking on the client in the first place is you believe that they're correct in, in what they're telling you. But to actually file the lawsuit, it's because you know you, you think you can win the case. You're not going to file a lawsuit if you don't think you can win. And if you think you can win the case, it's because you have a lot of freaking evidence, right? Um, so that was my first thought. When I first saw Dr. Kozier post about it, and then Kimberly Gautier post about it, is, wow, this lawyer must have a lot of evidence to not only take on a lawsuit, because that's just kind of like a baseline for a lawyer, but to take on a company as powerful as Hills Pet Nutrition, who is backed by Colgate Palmolive, that's who owns Hills. And then we can keep getting in the weeds for who owns Colgate, because that's just you know, this big conglomerate. There's so much money behind this. So much money 
behind big pet food. We could go on and on and on. And we just get in this like twisted web of companies that own each other and, you know, in, in different portfolios of stock. And it, it, that's not what today's episode is about. So there is so much money behind Hill's pet food. That's the bottom line. So to take on a lawsuit and file a lawsuit against them, you better have some really, really good evidence to, to back you up. So that was my first thought. Um, Susan Thixton's blog says, the legal complaint filed in Kansas on February 6, 2024 is 124 pages of scathing evidence against Hills Pet Food, the Morris Animal Foundation, the Mark Morris Institute, Dr. Lisa Freeman, Dr. Joshua Stern, Dr. Darcy Aden, Aden, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, A-D-I-N, and others claiming all were involved in, quote, an egregious, wide-ranging, and damaging campaign of coordinated, for-profit, faux-scientific misinformation by a large corporation, end quote, to make veterinarians and pet owners, falsely per their lawsuit, believe grain-free pet foods were dangerous, linked to canine heart disease. Quote, using the tools of professional science and Hill's vast veterinary influence network, the goal of the scheme was to persuade American pet owners that grain-free diets weren't just bad diets, but actually dangerous for dogs. An argument that, if successful, had the potential to eradicate the entire grain-free sector of the pet food market. They had been carrying out this wide-ranging scheme ever since, and it has been, by any measure, a breathtaking, if unlawful, success. End quote. The lawsuit complaint introduces the case with this information. Quote, Hills is unique among these three so-called traditional pet food companies for three different reasons. First, it is the smallest of the three. Its annual revenues dwarf those of most other pet food brands, but they are only about 20% of Purina's revenues. Second, as by far the largest maker of prescription-only diets in the country and as the self-proclaimed number one vet-recommended brand, Hills is tied much more closely to the veterinary community than either Mars or Purina. For Mars and Purina, marketing to vets and distributing through vet clinics are both relatively inconsequential parts of their sprawling companies. For Hills, they are a major component of the business. The third thing that makes Hills unique among the three traditional pet food companies is its uniquely poor financial performance in the years leading up to 2018, when the misconduct at the heart of this suit began. During this period, the market for pet foods made by non-traditional, often independent brands was growing explosively. For example, from 2011 to 2017, sales of grain-free dog foods, a leading category among independent makers, rose from 15% to 44% of all dog food sales in American pet specialty stores. Purina was so large and diversified that it weathered this storm successfully, growing steadily and persevering its market share from 2014 to 2017. But Hills did not. Over the same four-year period, Hill's annual revenues were pancake flat and its market share plunged by more than 20%. Long the third largest seller of complete diet dog food in the country, Hill's fell to, 20, uh, fell to fourth in 2018 after being overtaken by Blue Buffalo, the largest of the new wave of non-traditional pet food brands. Thus, beginning no later than 2018, Hills and a cluster of associated entities and individuals, collectively with Hills, the defendants, embarked on a drastic and unlawful course to reverse this slide. They carried out a scheme to falsely convince American dog owners that a massive, unrelated, and hugely diverse group 
of dog food products, essentially any product made by any of the hundreds of independent firms that were collectively eroding Hill's market share, all increase the risk and severity of a, deadline, a deadly canine heart disease die, called dilated cardiomyopathy, or DCM. To carry out this scheme, Hills, along with a group of closely bound academic veterinarians, the veterinarian defendants, and front organizations operating on Hills' behalf, acted in a coordinated conspiracy. First and most explosively, the veterinarian defendants fraudulently induced the United States Food and Drug Administration to launch a high-profile investigation into DCM. The second strand of defendants' scheme, Hill's co-conspirators, the veterinarian defendants, authored study after study about DCM and then mischaracterized the findings. The defendants also created and fostered social media environments, including at least one Facebook group that was an echo chamber, suppressing any contradiction of the propaganda campaign. End quote. Susan goes on to say, and then this lawsuit proceeds to provide detail after detail to how the defendants allegedly fabricated the entire grain-free pet food link to canine heart disease scheme, such as Part 1, the cherry-picking scheme. Defendants fraudulently induced the FDA to launch a high-profile investigation into grain-free diets and canine dilated cardiomyopathy. Quoting, significantly, 23 of the 28 canine cases in this report are more than 80% came from either Dr. Freeman or Dr. Aiden. Just five came from sources other than these defendants. In a nation with 70 million dog owners. Continue quote. Dr. Freeman and Aiden deliberately and intentionally chose an unrepresentative group of cases to show the FDA. They did this by cherry-picking DCM cases involving grain-free diets and submitting those to the FDA while si simultaneously withholding cases involving grain-containing diets, end quote. The lawsuit included this image of an email from Dr. Freeman to FDA regarding her protocol to submit DCM cases to FDA. Note the second bullet point under item two. So, recommended DCM protocol 6 18 Number one, collect a complete diet history from on all patients at every visit. Exact diet, treats, table food, raw hides, chews, supplements, and foods used for medication administration. See below and attach for diet history forms. Number two, if patient is eating any diet besides those made by well-known, reputable companies, or if eating a boutique, exotic ingredient, or grain-free diet. Bullet point one, have owners save all current foods they are feeding, including bags, cans, or other packaging. Bullet point, point two, report case to FDA. The FDA website includes other useful tips for suspected important information for pet food companies. The lawsuit continues, quote, in other words, under the protocol that Dr. Freeman established, an FDA report should only be submitted if a DCM positive dog was not eating one of the core products made by either Hills or one of the other two largest and best established manufacturers in the country. Freeman's own protocol establishes that she cherry picked her samples in a way that would create the impression of a connection between smaller brands, products, and DCM, whether grain free or not. End quote. The above is only a small part of a very detailed lawsuit. It includes a wealth of information evidencing the many involved and why they were involved in the Hills and the claimed scheme. It includes damning information about the influence of Hills with veterinary schools, information on Dr. Freeman's similar attack on raw pet food, and so much more. There's also a link to read the full complaint, so I will include the uh, uh, Susan Thixon's blog post link in the show notes for you so you can get to that as well. Uh, Susan continues, the lawsuit is a class action, but the only plaintiff mentioned is Keto Natural Pet Foods Inc. The suit is seeking lost profits, reputational damages, and other economic injuries in an amount exceeding two billion, billion with a B precise amount to be proven at trial. Um, Susan goes on with her personal opinion. This lawsuit took courage to file, 
filing any lawsuit against big pet feed giants is not a simple matter. This lawsuit gives us hope that manufacturers and veterinary scientists will, in the future, think twice before participating in potential schemes to defraud the public. Hidden secrets can become public knowledge when determined individuals have the courage and endurance to keep digging for the evidence. Kudos to Keto Natural Pet Foods for their determination. We will continue to watch this lawsuit closely. So that is the lawsuit that has been filed against Hills Pet Nutrition as well as uh, select veterinarians who were, it's seemingly, obviously, uh, very closely involved in creating this scheme against grain-free pet foods. Uh, and there was a, a note there from Susan that uh, these veterinarians are also very anti-raw as well. So. Um, you and I know how much propaganda, how much propaganda is out there. And the big three, Hills, Mars, Purina, have so much money. I know that the lawsuit showed, or what, what I just read you about the lawsuit showed the drastic um, decline in Hills status in the pet food market. That still does not mean they don't have the insane amounts of money uh, required that to, to potentially squash something like this. Um, so it is very brave of these people to, to file this lawsuit and to continue on. Um, because I imagine, I don't know these people, but I imagine because they feel so strongly in the product they brought to market, whether it's a product I would feed or not, that's irrelevant. They feel so strongly in the product they brought to market and that it was not causing any harm to pets and that they were falsely accused. So in my mind, I, again, I, I just hope, my biggest hope, for all of this, and I, we talked about on the live podcast with Isabel, the, uh, everything that's going on with Purina right now, and there's just so much. And every single time something happens, I never, ever, ever want anything bad to happen to a dog or a cat. I don't want anyone's animal to become sick. I don't want anyone's animal to die. Um, it happens. Like, we all... We all have a short time on this planet, but to die earlier than, than we should have, would have, had we have been provided um, adequate nutrition, healthy food, clean air, clean water, all the things, right? So my biggest takeaway is that when anything like this happens, my hope is that more and more people realize the value of feeding fresh food to their pets and more and more people start digging in and doing more research and learning about all of the incredible benefits of, if not completely transitioning, at least adding fresh foods in to their pet's diets. So I'm hopeful <laughs> along with everyone else that this lawsuit will open, if, if nothing else, open more people's eyes. I know there are companies out there who are going to want to join this class action um, because their brand suffered, maybe even died because of what happened and what um, is alleged to have happened, to have happened um, from Hill's Pet Nutrition as well as their uh, veterinary conspirators. It's also sad to me um, that our pets are pawns, I guess, is, is the bottom line. They shouldn't be. Uh, they, they should not be. They're our family. And we should feed them like family. And um, so I hope you join me 
whatever platform you have, even if you don't have a business, you don't have a social media file, if it's just your friends and family, talk to them about making changes in their everyday life to treat their pets more like the family that they are. Removing toxic chemicals from the home, removing plastics, um, hydrating food, feeding fresh foods, minimal vaccinations, all of the things. Um, because nature provides and we can be a bright light when people see all of this darkness happening. So that's what's going on <laughs> with this lawsuit with Hills uh, Pet Nutrition and Hills Pet Food and their veterinary uh, accused co-conspirators, I should say. And please, if you're not already following Susan Fixton on Truth About Pet Food, please do so because she is going to have um, probably some of the best insight into any updates that are happening in this lawsuit. And yeah, so that's what's going on. It's been a little while since it was just me talking to you. And um, I was wondering when I was going to be able to do it again. And I felt like this was the perfect opportunity to do that. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I hope it was educational. It helped you understand what's going on, some of the backstory behind all of it. And um, bottom line is I am not against grain-free foods. Um, I do think there is potential for legumes fed in large quantities to cause anti-nutrient properties. I also think um, that there is potential to be found in these studies with feeding less than the bag says to feed because it is all synthetic, basically all synthetic nutrients um, being provided in those uh, uh, bags of feed. So there is obviously more to the story and we are finally seeing that we weren't wrong <laughs> in the fact that there was more to the story. So um, thank you so much for joining in, tuning in today. I have more episodes recorded with incredible guests coming up. So if you're not already following the podcast, please make sure you do so. If you just found me because of this, um, also make sure to follow me on all the socials. Instagram is where I mainly live. It's at the Pet Parenting Reset. And um, I will talk to you with an another incredible guest next week. Until then, please give your pets some extra love from me. Bye, guys. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh.